Okay, we start our uh, discussion on signal conditioning circuits, which uh, we were doing last time. We continue on that, and we will also discuss integration of microsystems and microelectronics, because after all, this has uh, mechanical structures which are realized uh, to sense or actuate and also electronic circuits. Uh, micro system will consist both of them. Now, we, what we are going to see is how do we put them together that also we will discuss here. So, the topics of discussion today will be signal conditioning circuits, integration of micro systems and micro electronics. Now, under the signal conditioning circuit, we have already discussed instrumentation amplifier in the last lecture number 33 and also analog to digital converters ADC. This also we discussed in our lecture number 33. So, today under the heading signal conditioning circuits, we will discuss Wheatstone bridge, which is very useful in uh, uh, piezo resistive sensing devices like pressure sensors and even in accelerometers. We will also discuss switched capacitor circuits, where uh, which is used for sensing uh, outputs from, from capacitive sensors like capacitive accelerometers or capacitive pressure sensors. We will also discuss the phase locked loop circuit to sense frequency shift which will be useful in many of the uh, vibration uh, circuits, vibration devices. So, first we start on with the, the Wheatstone bridge. It is very widely used for Im improving signal in piezo resistive pressure sensor and accelerometers. After all, a piezo resistive sensor is a resistor whose value changes when it is subjected to stress. Okay, now, but the change in the resistance will be so small that it will be difficult to measure the resistance as it is. For example, if there is a 1 k resistor and if it, its change is just about 1 ohms due to the stress, you can hardly measure that change 1 in 1000 that is very difficult. So, to take care of that aspect, the Wheatstone bridge is used. Here, four resistors are connected. They are located on a membrane or a beam such that you know, these locations are just arranged such that the resistors on the opposite arms here, this arm and this arm on the opposite arms of the bridge increase from r to delta r, r plus delta r. And on the other opposite arms, it will decrease from r to r minus delta r. Here, it is r plus delta r and r plus delta r. On the left hand side here, this r minus delta r and r minus delta r. Under quiescent conditions, that is when there is no stress on the membrane, all the four resistors are, are equal to each other, they are 1 kilo ohms normally that is the value is used. So, while sensing the stress, these, this bridge will become unbalanced because r will become r plus delta r, this also will increase, these two resistance will fall. They are located in such places that this change takes place and the delta r, I have taken it to be equal in all the cases, it need not necessarily be equal. Okay. So, you apply voltage V in and there is no stress, output voltage taken across the other two terminals is 0. So, due to this stress experienced by the membrane, that stress is transferred as stray as strain on these resistors and the resistance value changes. Now, looking at this bridge, you can see that the output voltage in the unbalanced condition will be V in into this voltage minus that voltage, voltage at this point A, this point this right hand side point here B. 
are not written to be, but a and b let us say. So, voltage here on left hand side is actually equal to V in divided by sum of the two resistors which is 2 R multiplied by this resistor which is R plus delta R. So, the left hand side voltage is V in into R plus delta R voltage across this divided by the sum of the two it is a voltage divider and voltage on the right hand side is actually sum of the volt resistors is R R plus delta R plus R plus delta minus delta R which is 2 R and the voltage across this will be input voltage divided by the total resistance 2 R multiplied by the resistance which is R minus delta R that is what I put here. So, V in naught is equal to V in <coughs> into R plus delta R by 2, 2 R minus R minus delta R by 2 R which simplifies to V in into this R R cancels and you get 2 delta R by 2 R which is delta R by R. Therefore, V naught now you can see will be delta R by R into V input. Now, you can see if delta R changes by 1 percent that is if R is 1 k and if delta R is 1 ohm this is 1 by 1000 that is 10 to power minus 3. So, input is 1 volt output is 1 volt into 1 by 1000 that is 1 millivolt. So, that is a measurable quantity. If I have 10 volts input, it will be 10 millivolts output. So, that is a measurable quantity. Okay? So, that is the benefit of using Wheatstone's bridge. Now, let us take a look at the location of these resistors. In fact, we will have very detailed discussion on the pressure sensor in subsequent lectures, but today I will just give the principle. Here, this is a bridge. I have shown it as R1, R2, R3, R4. In fact, all of them are all of them are equal to R. Just to distinguish between the two resistor locations, I put them R1 located here, then R2 here, R3 here, R4 here. R1, R2, R3, R4. Okay. Now you can see this is the membrane, maybe 10 microns thickness of the membrane. Dimensions may be something like 500 micrometer by 500 micrometer. This is looking at the top. This is the membrane location, membrane which is maybe 500 micron by 500 micron. Now, this membrane is made up of silicon in the micro machining and you can you remember in the technology course lectures you have gone through this if I, I can etch from through this and reduce the thickness by using what is known as an isotropic etching. This will be 1 1 1 plane and this will be 1 0 0 plane. So, you can etch it down in a controlled way using potassium hydroxide agent to get a thickness of 10 microns or 15 micron or whatever you like to have and what is the thickness etcetera decided by the design criterion which we will discuss in our subsequent lectures. So, now focusing on the location of the resistors this is the membrane. Okay. This square membrane if you subject it to stress on the top that is perpendicular to the perpendicular to the membrane okay, from the top into the plane of this uh, paper, if I subject it, these two resist there will be stress, maximum stress will be at the edges. That is why locate this R 1, R 2, R 3, R 4 all of them at the edges, where the for a given pressure and pressure the stress is maximum at the edges at the center of the uh, edge. But R 1 and R 3 will experience longitudinal tensile stress. That means, it will get pulled out, it will get stretched. As a result of that, if it is a p type resistor, when it is stretched, this is also a diffused resistor, when it is stretched, the resistance value increase by delta R. So, that is why I put here R 1, uh, R 1 will go up by delta R. R 3 also will go up by delta R and R 2 experiences it gets experiences transfer stress that is gets stretched in the uh, lateral direction perpendicular to this length it will stretch in this direction that means in the transfer direction when it is stretched stretched when it experiences the strain it is a transfer strain or transfer stress and then Effectively, you can look into it as the area increase. Rho L by A is the change in resistance, area increase, resistance 
decreases. So, these two resistances will decrease that is R 2 and R 4 will decrease. In fact, in a piezo resistor you will see that it is not only the uh, area increasing, it is the rho also changing that contributes to the change in the resistance. That part we will see uh, when we go into details of the pressure sensor. Okay. So, because of the tensile stress here these two will increase transverse tensile longitudinal stress because of transverse stress R 2 and R 4 will decrease that is how this pressure sensor works. So, if a p type resistor you will have V naught will be equal to delta R by R into V input. Now, the sensitivity of this pressure sensor will be given by delta V naught change in resistance due to a change in pressure by delta P that is the definition of the sensitivity. So, more about this pressure sensors we will see later when we go into the design of into a case study of a pressure sensor. Now, let us take a look at another circuit which is very useful for sensing capacitors capacitive sensing devices. So, this looks uh, bit look we will take a look at it, it looks complicated it is not at all complicated because all that is done is there is an op amp here to the inverting terminal you connect a capacitor C 1 and between the inverting terminal and the output terminal you capacitor connect a C 2. C 2 may be the capacitance that you want to oh, measure which is connected to the which is the output of a uh, capacitive sensor and C 1 is a known capacitor. Ultimately, what you are doing is comparing the C 2 with C 1 in terms of the signal voltage. How it is done is by charging this capacitor C 1 first by means of V of s and transferring okay, when you charge this capacitor by means of V of s the voltage across this C 1 will be I am sorry the charge across C 1 will be C 1 into V of s. Now, if that is completely transferred on to the C 2 the charge across the capacitor will be same as C 1 into V of s, but here it will you will see that it will become C 2 times V naught. So, both of them are equal C 1 and V s are known okay, V naught is can measured. So, C 2 can be measured that is the principle of that. So, it is done by means of this switched capacitor circuit. So, you can see transistor T 1, T 2, T 3 all of them have their gates connected together to a signal V so a voltage V 1. That means, whenever I apply voltage V 1 that is actually gate voltage to T 1, T 2, T 3 whenever I apply voltage to T 1 greater than this threshold voltage minimum voltage required to make the switch on that is that is V threshold. When V g is v greater than threshold voltage V, v T h there are T 1, T 2, T 3 they are actually switches. So, they will close as shown here T 1, T 2, T 3 they are switches when I apply gate voltage there will be path between the source and drain will be complete that means, the switch is closed. So, you can see T 1, T 2, T 3 are shown as close, close switches when V 1 is greater than threshold voltage, but V 2 equal to 0 when V 2 equal to 0 this switch is open T 2, T 4, T 4 is open. So, that means actually and T 3 is closed that means, the circuit now is path is like this to V naught and this is connected to ground. So, T 3 is connected to ground because of the switch that means, the voltage here is 0 as we have seen earlier in the inverting circuit if the plus terminal has got voltage 0 since the difference between the two voltages is practically 0 or negligible this voltage also will be 0. So, on the other side of the plate C 1 the voltage is V of s on this side it is 0. So, capacitor C 1 gets charged to C 1 uh, to, to a voltage V s. So, charge across that capacitor C 1 is C 1 into volt, voltage V of s q is equal to C into V. Okay. So, q is C 1 into V of s across this. Okay. Now, at this point the output is actually 0 because this is connected to this point this is just charge. Next what we do is open all these three switches whichever was closed 
that means, I reduce this voltage V1 to 0 and apply a pulse or voltage to V2. When V2 is applied, T4 closes and circuit will be like this. So, same circuit I have shown here, all that you do is T1, T2, T3 are open, that is no voltage applied to V1, but V2 is we apply voltage greater than threshold voltage, therefore, V2 will be closed. Now, you can see what you have is this is open. There was when I at the end of the first phase, when I turned off V1 and when I turned on V2, that is when T4 was closed, at that instant there was a voltage charge C1 into V of S across C1. That was the charge. Now, the moment this is closed, this capacitor discharges through this terminal to the plus terminal. That means, this plus is applying into this and immediately the output voltage starts rising going towards higher value till the entire charge is transferred this output voltage reaches the value V naught, where C naught into V naught is equal to the charge deposited on this this capacitor. And if C naught V naught C 2 V naught is the charge deposited that has come from this capacitor C 1 that is that is C 1 into V of S. So, output voltage will rise to a value V naught till C 2 into V naught is equal to C 1 into V of S. What we are telling is by closing this switch, the entire charge has through this positive terminal has got transferred on to this capacitor C 2. Okay. So, if I know the, the value of uh, C 1, which is a known capacitor and V s is a known signal and I can measure V naught, then I can get the value of C 2 because of this relationship. So, you will have C 2 is equal to C 1 into V s by V naught. Everything else on the right hand side is known. I can measure C 2. So, this is used in capacity sensing uh, accelerometers or pressure sensors. To illustrate whatever I have discussed uh, uh, earlier, now we go through that V 1 this is a circuit V 1 is applied, so that these three switches are closed and then C 1 into V of S is the Q that is deposited on this capacitor during that so long as V 1 is present that is like this. Okay. V 1 is that one, the charge is here corresponding charge is C 1 V of S, C 1 V of S, C 1 V of S, C 1 V of S if nothing happens. But what we are doing is at the end of this pulse V 1, you are switching on this V 2. So, whatever charge has happened here during this phase when the V 2 is switched on, the this switch is closed, T 4 is closed, therefore, that charge is transferred on to the capacitor here. So, V 1 is closed, charging test phase, V 2 is closed, discharging test phase from C 1 to C 2. So, this is charging, discharging, charging, discharging is done it's because these are digital outputs which are available for you. So, that is the way you get where you can use this uh, uh, switch capacitor. You are switching this capacitor from one to other one. So, switch capacitor circuit you can do that. Now, we will discuss the phase lock loop circuit. So, the phase lock loop PLL it is a very popular circuit. It is used uh, in uh, many applications as we will see a little later. What it has is a phase detector which has input signal V in and another input signal is V f that is feedback voltage from this entire circuit V f. These are the two inputs f in is the input frequency of the input uh, signal, f naught is the frequency of this uh, voltage controlled oscillator if the signal is not present. If the input signal is not present, f naught is the free running frequency of this particular oscillator. Okay. Now, phase detector is actually looked upon as, as a uh, multiplier, okay, so that you will have d c plus uh, AC signals which are uh, sum and difference of these two frequencies. So, you will have DC and high frequencies. So, that is filtered using low pass filter. All the high frequency components are, are 
removed, so that only DC is present. And the DC output is amplified using a DC amplifier, it is op amp circuit. I have not shown what it is. So, this is amplified. And the amplified output V naught is the input to the voltage controlled oscillator. This voltage controlled oscillator gives AC signal whose frequency depends upon the DC voltage. Okay. When the DC voltage is absent, it will have a free running frequency as an oscillator which has a particular capacitance inside LC circuit and it will give a certain frequency F naught. But if there is a DC voltage input there, the F naught will change. So, how much you want to change the F naught? Okay, how much the F naught changes depends upon V naught. How much V naught is available depends upon the difference between the two frequencies. If the difference between the two frequencies is there, then it will result in a voltage V naught, so that the F naught is gets locked down to F in. In other words, this circuit will track the F naught, the frequency of this voltage control oscillator will track whatever frequency is there at the input. So, this will give you actually the frequency from the circuit that is being tested or used a vibration sensor for example. If its frequency changes due to some force, you can measure the frequency using this particular circuit or you can calibrate this V naught to get that frequency. Okay. That is the measure of the uh, frequency change and the change in frequency is a measure of the force that is experienced in that sensor. So, just to go through it quickly, phase detector compares the phase of the input signal uh, whose frequency is f in with that of the feedback voltage frequency f naught. Low plus filter removes all the high frequency components, a DC voltage is amplified and fed to the voltage controlled oscillator VCO as popularly mentioned as whose output frequency f naught is proportional to V naught. It is a linear function of V naught. Okay. Now, if f naught shifts slightly, I am sorry, if f in, if the signal frequency changes slightly, the phase difference between f in and f naught begins to increase. This change or this changes, this phase difference changes the control voltage V naught to the VCO in such a way as to bring the VCO frequency to the same value as f in. So, all that this V naught does is it senses the phase difference between the two and the voltage developed here is such that it brings the frequency of the oscillation of the VCO back to the V in. That is it gets locked on to the f in that is why it is called the phase locked loop circuit. Okay. Now, few terms that is the operation of the phase locked loop few terminologies. Okay. It has three modes of operation. One is the free running mode that means, there is no signal here. If there is no signal input, the free output frequency of the voltage control oscillator is F naught that is called as the center frequency F naught. Next, one more mode of operation is the capture mode and this requires a signal frequency f in to be present. So, when that is present, the moment you apply that, okay, before you applied the frequency of f naught, now the moment you apply, apply this signal here, f in will certainly be different from the free running frequency. So, because of this f in difference, there is voltage developed and f naught will begin to change or increase continuously till it matches with f in. So, that is called the locking phase locking or the ok. So, the PLL is in phase lock mode when the VCO frequency is equal to the input uh, signal frequency. So, this is the uh, phase locked mode. Now, let us see the one more aspect of this. 
there are couple of frequency bands of interest for the PLL operation. One is the capture range F c F c. It is the range of the input centered around F naught over which output signal frequency of the VCO can acquire lock in with F in. See for example, this F in F naught is let us say 100 kilohertz just for example, it is 100 kilohertz and if this is uh, uh, this can take uh, a range 100 kilohertz plus or minus say 10 kilohertz. So, then the 10 kilohertz is called the capture range okay, over which the uh, VCO is able to acquire lock in. So, that is the limitation of that particular uh, phase lock loop circuit. If it if the frequency difference is exceeding F c that is the capture range, the voltage control oscillator will not be able to lock in onto that. Okay. That is the limitation of that. Now, there is one more band which is called the lock range. See, for example, if the capture range is let us say 10 kilohertz and F naught is I am sorry, five, five, uh, yeah, capture range is 1 kilohertz and F naught is 10 kilohertz. Okay. So, that 1 kilohertz is the capture range. Now, once it has locked down to let us say 10.5 kilohertz, the PLL once it has achieved capture, it can maintain lock, lock with V in signal over somewhat wider frequency range than F c. It need not be just 1 kilohertz, it can be slightly beyond that 1 kilohertz. What I am trying to point out is if F naught is 10 kilohertz, F c is 1 kilohertz, the lock range after it has locked down to the frequency within that range F c, it can maintain that lock in position to a slightly wider range that is the implication of that. Applications of uh, PLL used in all basic building blocks of electronic circuits. In micro systems, the PLL is used to measure the frequency shift which can be used to monitor change in the force or acceleration. In fact, you will see when you go to the accelerometer etcetera or the beams vibrating beams or you must have already seen it, the resonance frequency is uh, depends upon the ring constant and mass. Okay. So, depending upon that it will have a certain frequency of oscillation the resonance frequency. Now, if there is a change in the mass or spring constant or when it experiences a force, the there will be some change in the frequency if it is occurs due to some electrostatic force that can be sensed here. So, you can measure the force by measuring the frequency shift in the uh, beam. We will uh, see some of these details when we go on to the accelerometer structures. Okay. Now, next we will see though that I will that I uh, close our discussion on the signal conditioning circuits. Now, we will take on the uh, much more difficult task on paper it looks quite simple, but it is a much more difficult task that is that of integration of micro systems and micro electronics. In other words, you can have see what we are talking of now is in a micro system or uh, full system, we will have micro machined devices as one chip and also you can have electronic circuit as a separate chip. Okay. So, one way of having this integration of these two separate circuits is fabricate the micro system in the sense a MEMS device or a number of MEMS devices in one chip and the required electronics as we saw electronic circuits are required for sensing or for actuating. So, you realize that uh, electronic circuit in a separate chip. 
Okay. And once you have these two separate pieces, all the metallization, everything is done on them and mount them on the same header or the same plate and close it, close it meaning package it under one capsule. That means, both the devices exit separately, but they are interconnected outside the chip by wire bonding connecting one wire from one chip to another chip, you run external wire okay, to connect them together. It is actually a thin wire which is bonded on to one device on one wafer or one chip and other end of the wire bonded on to another uh, uh, bond pad of another device, another chip. So, these two chips are interconnected by means of the wires interconnected. Okay. So, this is the hybrid integration. Two separate chips mounted on a single package connected internally by means of external connection. The problem with this type of thing is the processing cost will definitely be more because you are processing two separate chips independently. Advantage is the electronic circuits, VLSI circuit people can make the electronic circuit and the MEMS technology can exist completely in a separate location and independent of them, they can independently design and independently fabricate these two chips and then bring them together to a separate foundry where it can be packaged. So, you can see this is the hybrid mode. Apart from the uh, cumbersome uh, packaging or the uh, cost involved in all these things uh, interconnecting the two separate chips outside. The other difficulties that are associated are the stray capacitances and stray inductances which come from the interconnecting wire and interconnecting capacitor. Because these lengths of the wires will definitely be more than few millimeters within the chip. You need to reduce those lengths of those. If you have to do that, you have to bring them, you have to put the two chips together in one chip that is monolithic formation of the chip. Okay. So, that is you can an alternate approach, better approach would be not fab, do not fabricate two separate chips, fabricate one single chip where entire electronics and also the entire MEMS device is put on the same chip. It will require smaller size compared to two chips number two and all this interconnection between the two devices that is the MEMS chip and also this uh, uh, the electronics that is done by running metal connections on the chip itself. That length can be very small and the capacitances, inductors, everything can be reduced. Okay. That is the biggest advantage of uh, fabricating these two devices in one chip which is known as monolithic fabrication. Monolithic means fabricated on the same stone or same chip. Okay. So, you can have different approaches for this monolithic uh, integration. That is uh, one of the approach is the modular approach. Here, what we do is the two foundries, that is the microelectronics foundry and also the MEMS foundry, these two can be totally different foundries. So, what you do is take a wafer, in some portion of the wafer, you make the electronic circuit leaving some space very near to that electronic circuit space required for making the MEMS. So, you go through the entire processing of this microelectronic circuit, complete it with even with the metal connection etcetera within the device, then seal it. So, that it is safe to transfer from one place to another place okay, and send it off to another foundry where the, the uh, micro fabrication will be done. Okay. So, there 
the second company which does this microfabrication does not bother about electronics. All that is does is it operates only on the place located for that industry to make those MEMS devices. We will just take a look at the different approaches used for that. So, modular approach is actually do it in one place, take it to another place, fabricate that device. But another approach is do the both the things, okay? the micro sensor and also the micro electronics fabricate them together in the same foundry, same integrated circuit foundry that will be the best. Though people may have some hesitations to use the uh, some of the etching techniques in the VLSI technology, because you may use potassium hydroxide for etching the silicon to realize the MEMS device that may not be acceptable in some places. Then you have to change your method of etching that that is how people take a look do take it to the acceptable level. Okay. So, I will discuss these two approaches now here one is the modular approach which was actually done first demonstrated by Berkeley. So, where micro circuits are fabricated first in IC foundry and handed over to micro machining foundry to do the sensor or actuator part without bothering about the circuitry that we will see first. So, this is the do not be frightened about this uh, appearance of this. What I am showing here is the cross section cross sectional view of a CMOS and microstructure that is actually accelerometer fabricated with the modular approach meaning you have fabricate see this portion on the left hand side here what I am encircling here that portion is representing the electronics portion. Here what we have shown is only the CMOS inverter that is you have P channel MOSFET here on the left hand side and you have these n channel MOSFET here n plus source and drain p, 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 p type source and p type drain. So, as you may recall that we have discussed the CMOS inverter where the drain of the uh, p channel is connected to the drain of the n channel that is done within the circuit itself internally and the source is grounded and this drain is uh, this source is connected to power supply. Okay. So, here I am not going through the process steps right now. In one foundry you do all these processes of doing this P well, doing this N channel MOSFET, carrying out the P channel MOSFET, all this field oxide and the gate region realization number of process steps all of them are carried out to complete this CMOS inverter and CMOS based integrated circuit. And then what you do is before transferring on to the other industry where they make use of this portion on the right hand side, okay? this portion here that was le left blank when this portion was done and it was transferred on to the next industry. So, before doing that you must ensure that this region is not disturbed by these people in the next industry. So, how that is done? That is done by uh, using a putting a coating of uh, a coating of a, a low temperature oxide LTO is low temperature oxide 3000 of oxide you deposit this red color things all over including the region where the other company is to going to process. Okay. So, use the low temperature oxide and then on the top of that you have a low pressure chemical vapor deposition technique to deposit nitride. What happens is if I just send it only with this oxide layer when you transport from one place to other place the oxide is very hygroscopic it will absorb moisture. So, to avoid that and also to avoid any contaminants entering 
contaminants entering this device portion, you put a coating of nitride all through. So, you can see that when you send it from this industry to the next industry, this portion is blank, okay. this portion is blank and this portion is covered with the low temperature oxide LTO and also the chemical vapor deposition nitride, low pressure CVD nitride, which actually is passivating it, making it re less reactive. <coughs> okay. You do not worry about all these terminologies, which you would have seen already in the, in the technology. Phosphosilicate glass, which is actually P2O5, phosphorophentoxide and SiO2, which is present over the gate, which is needed for making the MOSFET technology. And this is the gate region all that is done in the first phase of the process in the first industry. The only thing that first industry should take care is before while it is being processed everything is complete. All that you have got is space provided for this sensor. In this case it turns out to be a accelerometer structure capacitive sensing accelerometer. You can see one electrode here another electrode here with a gap so that it can move up and down. Okay. So, from here when you take it to the next foundry, they will open this oxide here and nitride here, deposit a polysilicon on that portion, remove they do not tamper this portion, deposit polysilicon completely on this portion and then deposit some oxide and then deposit polysilicon remove the oxide in between the two. This is called the surface micro machining technique. You have top polysilicon which is separated from the bottom polysilicon poly 1 with a gap air gap. So, that if there is acceleration the mass can the top poly can move up or down depending upon the acceleration experienced by the top poly. It can move up or down depending upon that the capacitance between the two will change. You sense the you have to sense the capacitance to sense the acceleration. The deflection of the top mobile moving electrode tells you how much is the uh, acceleration or the force. That part we will discuss in while discussing the accelerometer. So, what is important to note here is when you transfer it, when you do that process, you will have high temperatures for depositing the polysilicon. Okay. So, since high temperatures are involved, the industry which does this initial process should ensure that whatever high temperature that the next industry subjects the wafer to should not hurt this device. Suppose you use aluminum for interconnecting the devices in this first stage, first industry, when I subject it to 600 50 degree centigrade, if this were aluminum that will melt and aluminum will flow all over. So, you cannot use aluminum for interconnection. You have to use refractory materials or like tungsten for metallization. See this is the tungsten metallization and the uh, you can use uh, uh, titanium nit nitride etcetera for the contact regions and interconnection can be done with, uh, with the chrome gold, which can withstand high temperature. So, you have to be careful if with your process in the first stage itself, if you are transferring on to the uh, next industry to go through the process. This is the problem with this type of uh, modular approach, where you do some CMOS first and take it to the next stage for the MEMS device to separate location. So, one has to take care of these things very carefully. This was done way back in 1992 with by Berkeley uh, uh, by these people, it is published already in ITEPLI. Other approaches for integration are apart from this, one that we have discussed is CMOS first and next the this process that we have said already that it requires high temperature processing during the micro system fabrication. Therefore, refractory metals and protective nitride layers should be used before transferring the wafer for the next stage. Alternately, one can fabricate micro systems first, do that 
mechanical device first and electronics portion next. In this approach, it is difficult to retain the microstructure during the subsequent process. For example, if I have released the accelerometer structure already which, which can move up and down like that, then if I transfer it on to another industry or even in the same place if you are doing the processing, during the processing those vibrating structures may move and during spinning processing vapor photolithography etcetera those moving parts may uh, break. So, this is one of the difficulty one has to take extremely extreme care though you have taken care of the high temperature process first. Okay. But a slightly better approach has been demonstrated in, in technology in the R and D sectors that if bulk micro machining is used, you are already familiar about bulk micro machining, where you uh, etch some portion of silicon to realize the structure. And then integration, you carry out integration okay, together. So, you use the bulk micro machining as the last step. First, you carry the uh, micro center portion and uh, first to carry out the circuit portion next to do the micro machining portion. See how this is a very very interesting thing people have demonstrated where you can actually see I am just giving you this process which is different from the one that we have discussed just now. Okay. Micro sensor and electronic circuit fabricated in, I, in the same IC factory a foundry on the same wafer. It is the integration. I am showing only one transistor here, it will be it may be a CMOS circuit or uh, it will be number of transistors together to realize that uh, uh, circuit portion. So, notice here you as done earlier this portion of the wafer, I am showing one device, there are number of such devices side by side on the single wafer. Ultimately, you have to dice them to realize single device. So, I am showing that single portion of the device. So, what you do is first front side process is carried out first. You carry out this portion up to realizing this most nothing is protect this portion completely where your sensor comes this portion protect it completely focus only on this particular portion, make this particular device that is do the source strain diffusion, do this uh, gate oxide, gate poly all, all this thing is completed. This field oxide will be present everywhere. So, the after completing the electronics portion, do not complete that interconnection portion that is done ultimately. So, here you do what you do is take it in a stage after this is open at that stage you will have oxide everywhere here protected. Remove the oxide by photolithography, open this window, carry out a n plus diffusion, n plus is heavily doped n type phosphorus diffusion you carry out to serve as one electrode of a capacitively sensored capacitive uh, pressure sensor. After all a capacitive pressure sensor will have a fixed electrode. Okay, that is this n plus region what we are showing and another electrode which can experience the pressure and can move up or down. So, the change in the capacitance between the two is the one that you are sensing. So, the bottom electrode is decided by this n plus region almost like a metal instead of talking of a metal you talk of n plus diffusion. After this what you do is I have just skipped various steps, but I am showing you what is done. First MOSFET circuit followed by opening the oxide and n plus diffusion for sensor portion is done. You are processing only the front side the top side of the wafer. <coughs> then <coughs> what you do is deposit this PSG shown by one color all through everywhere phosphoric glass which is P 2 O 5 dot S O 2. Deposit that it can be done by the chemical vapor deposition techniques. <coughs> by reaction of phosphine, oxygen and silane. Then you etch out these trench portions, only this portion right up to the bottom. 
so that you have access up to this bottom you have opening here to carry it out and deposit polycrystalline silicon here this color on the top is the polycrystalline silicon okay and then after doing that you know you etched out from all the, these portions and these portions the trenches deposited poly everywhere etched out the poly etched out the poly from everywhere except this portion so you got this polysilicon over this sensor region and you have got metal also aluminum 1% silicon metal to make contact onto the source and the drain region of the mosfet this is a metal oxide semiconductor there is psg here okay so that with that you have got the uh, front side portion completed now you come back to the back side portion processing how is that you done you take it to the next stage you oxidize the back, back side fully completely and deposit oxide on this do a lithography open window of the back side here you must be able to align this portion with respect to the top so that this is exactly located below that portion for that you have got special equipment called the back side alignment uh, machine you can locate this window here in the oxide precisely aligned to this center of this portion and then etch out this silicon from here using koh etching so one sided anisotropic koh etch 80 degree centigrade for 6 hours plus that will etch fast drop the temperature to 60 degree etch for another 2 hours etch rate will be reduced so that you have got etching from this end to that until this hits this particular uh, n plus region etch that also down okay so what you did is you etched out this back side completely right in this portion now once that is reached you can remove this psg from here everywhere okay you can remove that psg from these portions polysilicon is present on this portion so you can put it in the buffered dilute hydrofluoric acid etchant that remove this psg from here and there is access from the bottom which would be you have got the mosfet and also you have ensured that this source drain is connected to this this polysilicon during this metal contact and to this gate contact you will take uh, contact somewhere laterally on the top surface of the wafer which cannot be seen in the cross section okay so at the end of this process you have realized the mosfet with the connection from this drain to this polysilicon you can see it is very close already done and this polysilicon is separated from this n plus region which you have realized here the this portion okay this n plus region is here that n plus region and this polysilicon are separated by means of the air gap in this example it's about 0.7 micrometers okay and this hole is about 50 microns only and this is about 750 microns the how much you get here size depends upon how much window you opened here for a 500 micrometer thick silicon wafer if i use about 750 microns then you will get about 50 microns so the size of this hole is decided by this how much area you want to open so the capacity is actually between this polysilicon which is movable and this fixed n plus region so when it is subjected to pressure for example i can apply pressure from the in the package we will see how it is done you can apply pressure from the bottom this is the pressure inlet you can put it in atmosphere where there is some high pre higher pressure it need not be high whatever is the pressure depends upon the design here we will discuss it subsequently you can subject it to stress pressure is there this membrane will deflect up when it deflects up the gap between the two increases from 0 0.7 to maybe 0 0.71 micron or of that order so because that deflects up the capacitance between the two electrodes will decrease because the gap is increased capacitance is epsilon a by d if d increases capacitance falls so the change in the capacitance is sensed using the circuit like the switched capacitor circuit you can change determine the change in capacitance or some other circuits electronics is used that circuit is present here you send the capacitance change that is why you can this is connected together this is the one way of making a pressure sensor 
integrated with electronics monolithically in the same industry. You can see that this K Y etching is done as a last step here. No high temperature, it is only just temperature is about 80 degree centigrade, you do not have to worry about this, I see it getting damaged. Okay. Now, the one that is reported in literature for this type of device is actually pressures up to 10 psi were measured, very low pressure. An output voltage of 2 to 2.5 volts was measured due to the capacitance change and that is this capacitance change is converted into change in voltage using the electronics. Now, before I wind up on this, one small thing that I want to show is this hole is etched from here right up to this. You can, you can, if you, you can use a circular window to open the oxide here. There is oxide usually below this that is open that and if wherever oxide is present at the bottom, the K O H will not etch it or the etch rate will be very small, you can etch through this. So, if that is whole mask in the window is, see everywhere there is oxide, you retain this uh, oxide everywhere except in the circular portion. Now, you put it into etchant. The etchant will etch through this oxide, but it will go over this, so that it becomes a square because this is the, if this is 1 0 0 wafer, this will be 1 1 0 planes, it will end up with that. So, if I start with the square thing, I will end up, more of these things we will see in our subsequent lectures. This will be a square opening that results at the bottom and when it goes to the other end, that is here, it will be square window and here it will be square window of this side. This is the opening that has resulted in and this was uh, as you saw here, that was 750 microns this width and this width will be 50 micron by 50 micron. So, that is the way you can all that you have to do is put a circular thing, H2 you will get a square thing if you want square. You do not have to have a draw circular thing. So, with that, I did close my discussion on the uh, integration of the sensors or mi micro sensors, micro devices along with electronics modular approach and also uh, approach in the same industry or hybrid approach, whichever is uh, available to you, one can use it. Thank you very much.